that happen. <laughs> All right. Yep, I see it. And have a good meeting, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay. Welcome, Yvonne. Nice to see you. Okay. And hi. I, hi. I do believe that Alexis will be joining us at some point. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let me just pull up my agenda here. And I am going to call to order the June 21st meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly at 2.02 p.m. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So welcome to everyone. We have a very specific agenda today, but I, before we get into that, let's go through and make sure everyone can be heard and can hear us. So let's start with you, Dr. Rhodes. I'm here and I can hear. Great. Dr. Shabazz? Yes, also here and can see. Okay, Paula? Um, yes, I can hear you and I think you can hear me. Can hear you, yes. And Yvonne? Yes, um, I can, I can, but I know my internet is a little spotty. So if I get dropped, I'll get back in and I might need to turn my camera off in order to stay in the meeting. Sure, that's no problem. Okay, great. So today's particular, today's agenda is particular to our request um, to designate cannabis tax revenue for the town council to designate cannabis tax revenue for reparations. Uh, we have a meeting with the finance committee at 3 p.m. in which this will be discussed. Um, and I want to share with you, um, I'm going to start to share my screen here in a second. Just give me a quick second here. Okay. Actually, you know what? I'm going to stop to share real quick. Before I go into that, just taking a moment to pause, see if there are any just immediate sort of comments or questions. I wanted to say I thought it was an excellent Juneteenth weekend. Uh, both Saturday and Sunday. And I saw on Facebook, Dr. Shabazz on Monday looked like some really great stuff happening as well. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, and so before I jump in, uh, are there any comments or questions right now from the committee? Okay. All right, no, share my screen and let's see here. All right, can everyone see the screen? All yes. Right. Great. yes. Okay, yes. so we met last week uh, and we had a very good discussion, I thought, about a policy proposal that I had brought forward. We made some adaptations to it. We talked about a couple of different um, a couple of different ideas around modeling versus designating the cannabis tax revenue. We talked about number amounts. Um, since then, I have had uh, what I thought was a really great meeting with Sean and Sonia. So Sean is our finance director at the town and Sonia is the comptroller. And we had a discussion so that I could understand from their perspective, where they were coming from in terms of <clears throat> our request and um, their concerns, the challenges that the town is facing financially in the coming years. Um, and I thought it was a really good discussion. And they started off by stating very clearly, um, Sean stated very clearly that it may appear like resistance and um, and sort of acknowledging um, that the town council made a commitment to reparations. And there are lots of other um, really uh, 
pressing and demanding initiatives that the town is undertaking right now, including two new departments, CRESS and DEI. Um, and, as, and, and maybe for AHRA members, it's not clear that the town also hired four new firefighters um, that are being funded currently through ARPA funds and will need to be worked into the budget. So with that discussion in mind, Sean felt like he could support as the finance director, a model in which we begin um, by sort of what we talked about last week, a hybrid model, where we begin by modeling the appropriation annually off the cannabis tax revenue. And then at some point, once DEI, once CRESS, and once the four firefighters are worked into the budget and more stable, switching over to designating the cannabis tax revenue um, in FY26. So that's what you'll see reflected here in this policy, which is basically um, everything that we discussed last week um, and including concerns, I think that counselors, so we're looking for broad support. We want this to be supported by the town council. We want it to feel um, like a meaningful, significant and responsible policy that we're putting forward here. Um, so just going through each of these items, um, again, I used that base appropriation, which comes from the FY21 actual cannabis tax revenue. We talked about the $2 million, um, so the appropriations would expire once the fund has reached that $2 million mark. And again, this is just related to the cannabis to, to this policy. So if we are to get CPA funds, for example, that is not included in this commitment. Um, and then the appropriations come from certified free cash in FY 23, 24, and 25, and then beginning in 26 come from cannabis tax revenue. There will be an annual review by the Finance Committee during the drafting of the budget policy guidelines, and this is to determine the health of the budget and the health of the um, finances in the town on a yearly basis, which happens anyway and, and um, is, is a part of our process. Um, and then we will, uh, this piece is added. So I found a really interesting document today from um, that, that outlines MGL policy or MGL law basically as it pertains to stabilization funds and how money gets into them, how they're created, how money gets into them and how money gets taken out of them, what sort of votes are needed by a, a legislative body for those things to happen. So we can pull that up if we want to in a second. But basically this is saying that we're gonna do everything legally. Um, and then we have a possible use of funds here. Um, and then at the bottom, it says that the full plan and eligibility criteria will be recommended by the HR, AHRA in their final report and approved by the town council. Um, and I see uh, coming into the finance committee meeting, this is what we'll be proposing. Um, and I see two potential um, points of uh, two challenges or two potential points of discussion, let's call it that, let's call them opportunities. Um, and I will talk with you about what those are in a minute, but first just wanting to pause and take comments and questions about this. Yes, Dr. Spass. So I would just say all of this looks very consistent with our discussions and particularly feedback that I offered. So I have no, uh, uh, I'm very appreciative of all the work you've done to try and and uh, workshop this through staff and, and town staff and, and other uh, counselors and um, uh, on the finance committee and to kind of get a sense of what, what might uh, meet some of the expectations that uh, your colleagues on the finance committee uh, have. Um, I, I know there is this continuing and abiding concern about possible use of funds. Um, it, uh, you know, I, I can 
I guess go along with a lot seeing that but that bullet point go in. I again really feel as though it uh, kind of encroaches on the community discussion. It kind of con encroaches on the community con consultative process for us to already be outlining at this point where the funds may go. These are, I, under, I get the point of possibilities, and for those that, that need to have, to, to hear that, see that, you know, maybe as a as an asterisk or whatever, but but in some ways that's the only thing that rankles me a little bit on on this listing uh, toward trying to get a policy through. But um, uh, but again, I I salute you and all all your efforts, and uh, that's what I'll submit to at this stage for discussion. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. And I, I want to point out that um, I don't see any reason that the use of funds would come into a motion at this time. Um, this was more, or even into the policy, um, I think this is more uh, to give counselors some sense. And I did pull these um, from the NCOBRA website, um, from their uh, suggestions for municipal reparation benefit ideas. Um, so I agree this may not be comprehensive for our community, and I also don't believe it needs to be incorporated into a motion at this point as we're creating this policy. Uh, yes, Dr. Rhodes. All right, so uh, you just said something. Um, so uh, the possible use of funds will not be a part of the motion. Is that correct? I don't believe that it needs to be, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see when we get there, but my, I don't, I believe that the motion um, that will get the broadest support in finance committee and on the council will be much, will be more simple and include just the financial aspects and not the uses. So the uses are really there just to give any counselor or counselors a sense of what may be, because one of the concerns we heard by a couple counselors is, well, what is the money going to be used for? But I don't think it will be um, in in a motion, but please, yeah, Dr. Dr. Rhodes, please, what so, were you gonna? So under uh, the possible use of funds, yeah. under direct, under direct uh, materials benefits, I certainly would add, uh, youth entre entrepreneurship and scholarships. And I'll talk more about that. Um, and the other one would be uh, uh, recreational program. Mm -hmm. uh, and, You're gonna uh, test my spelling skills. <laughs> <that's all right. laughs> okay, so youth entrepreneurship and scholarships. And what was the second one? A uh, recreation. Recreation programs. Now, the reason for youth entrepreneurship and scholarships is that uh, I, I would like to see uh, one of the national youth entrepreneurship programs uh, happen here in Amherst. And there are a couple of them. And one of them I, I directly participated in years ago as uh, a director and also as a teacher of uh, youth entrepreneurship, uh, especially in uh, New Orleans after uh, Katrina. And um, some of those programs, when you bring them in, uh, require that uh, you know, people pay for them. So having scholarships as a part of them is uh, one way to, to ensure that especially uh, uh, African-American uh, citizens, students, kids uh, will be able to participate. And, and, and obviously the recreation programs is, is something that uh, we need to be mindful of, especially in light of uh, the ARPA money that's in process of being spent, uh, about $500,000 where they're exploring uh, uh, recreation programs. And those programs uh, need to be uh, ones that uh, have uh, in one sense a specific em emphasis for minority students. Excellent, okay, excellent. Yes, Yvonne. Um, would, is there any mention, maybe I missed it, of um, using um, funds for education? 
for because we're going to end up doing that right with some of this these funds about not just scholarships but oh, programs okay. that will educate or inform people about moving forward um, with um, with reparations. I think that's a great question, Yvonne, and I think that's a separate discussion related to our operating budget that we need as we begin to go into education and engagement of the community. Um, and I've talked a bit with Paul about that already. We had some money that he had set aside from last year. We used about half of that now for the Black Census, um, but we have more and we have a small seed fund of the $206,000 in there. So if we put together a budget for operating expenses that include educating, engaging the community, um, we can bring that forward and ask for the council to approve that at any point. So that's um, a separate sort of matter um, from this, if that makes sense. Uh, thank you. Oh, no, you have my email. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me, uh, uh, Dr. Rhodes, your hand is still up. Or, no, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. Okay. Um, I would like to, I don't see Hala's hand raised yet, um, but Hala, please let me know if you'd like to jump in here. I What I wanted to spend a little time on is addressing the two matters that I think will be the points of discussion um, at the Finance Committee. The first matter is whether this should be a fully um, a, a policy that's fully modeled off of cannabis tax revenue, whether this should be a policy that's hybrid, as we've suggested here. And again, that was the recommendation um, of Sean this morning in my conversation with him. Um, and then the third being whether we're talking about a full designation um, that does not include modeling, but is an earmark, which we've had the most amount of challenge with, I think. The second matter that I believe we will have um, an opportunity to discuss is the total commitment that we're looking for. I don't believe that the yearly or the annual appropriation will be, um, a major discussion. I believe that the two million that we are recommending um, may be <clears throat> a point of discussion. And so with both of those, being that I'm the only one in our group that can make an amendment to a motion that could be brought at the finance committee meeting, I'd like to get direction from you about what, where you'd like me to go. So for example, if a motion comes forward that's based fully off of modeling, um, are, can we live with that as long as we are clear that the intention is that we're modeling it off of the cannabis tax revenue for all of the reasons that we've outlined is morally and ethically important um, and if let's say a motion says appropriations to reach 1 million or a million and a half, would you like me to make uh, a counter motion or a motion to, re to revise the motion that's on the table, for example, um, to take us up to that 2 million? And before I open it for discussion, uh, and it doesn't mean it will be approved, but I I'd like to get... Um, uh, I'd like to get your sense of that. So those are the two the two things, the, the sort of function, the modeling versus the designation or the earmark and the total appropriation. Um, just be, it's important to understand that this is a finance committee recommendation. In my mind, it carries a lot of weight. Um, it is important because this is the body that is tasked with really understanding the health, the financial health of the town. Um, and so the more consensus we can get, the better. Um, that being said, we could make a recommendation as a finance committee and at council when it comes as recommended to the full council, another entire discussion is going to happen that could change um, it's not necessarily going to mirror 100% what 
what the recommendation from the finance committee is. So just to be clear on that. So taking comments now on those two matters. Yes, Dr. Shabazz. Thank you. That, that was a lot. So I'm gonna to try to address it the best way I can think about addressing it. And that's first of all, to say, you know, the, um, the $2 million figure I recommended is really a floor, it's not a ceiling. So in terms of if that becomes a, uh, a point of discussion uh, relative to the finance committee recommendation, um, the you know negotiating and haggling for for less um, over less is um, I, I I just can't even begin to think about the the scenarios around that um, the the real issue here that I see is you know we're we're it seems as though we're backing into um, it, we're putting ourselves in a box here. We started out with this as a recommendation around one funding stream. One funding stream we were trying to identify and trying to get a sense of the council if there might be a will to um, capture that funding stream for the purpose of the reparative justice plan we've been charged to develop. It now seems as though even though, you know, it has their from cannabis tax revenue, the, the sense that I'm getting as you talk about these possibilities of the debate around the finance committee recommendation, it almost sounds like, you know, we're, 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 we're in a box now of what the whole funding package might be, you know, ad infinitum around reparative justice, black reparations in, in Amherst. And, 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 and so it, 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 it's a, it's a, it, it creates a, a, a feeling, a bit of anxiety that where we move, we're moving from just one funding stream to begin to see what we have, so to speak, uh, no pun intended, what we have in the pot to, to begin to develop proposals and, and go through a consultative process with the community around, it now seems as though we're, 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 we're moving toward defining uh, the total financial um, uh, commitment that the town may uh, uh, be prepared to put in on this forever. And, and that, that just feels, feels, feels bad at this point. Um, you know, the, uh, so for me, coming back to the, the, the one other part of the question, modeling versus a direct earmark vote versus some type of hybrid. Well, we're around that, I'm, I'm clearly in the middle, which I see kind of consistent with what's on the screen. Because again, as I see it, from the current fiscal year we're in, the, if, if any contribution is to be made this year, this year, in October, in November, whatever, it, it, at all, from uh, certified free cash, if any contribution is to be made this year, the way it was done last year, it's got to come through this process, okay? Cannabis earmark isn't even going to touch that, whether you made it for the, for, you know, for whenever you made it for. It's not going to touch this year's contribution to reparative justice. It's not going to affect next year's contribution, okay? And then hearing the concerns about the financial uh, picture, the cliff and all of this, I was prepared to say, let's not even try to, to address an earmark for fiscal year 24 or 25. If there are those concerns, let's go with the free cash, certified free cash process to the extent there may or may not be anything there relative to uh, uh, other financial commitments, relative to the percentages you wanna maintain and all of the other discussion we've heard. Maybe there won't, there'll be zero in fiscal year 24 contributed or, or from fiscal year 25. I get all of that, okay? But it's about a projection. It's about what we're, what, what we're, we're willing to put ourselves on record to trying to do. By 26, I feel, if 
the financial picture, the working in of these four firefighters, the working in of Crest, the working out of, of, of uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Office of Equity and Inclusion and, and getting a sense of the needs of those units, those new departments and, 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 uh, and, and our firefighting force. And, and then the big pack capital projects looming and, and inflation and recession and everything else. I get all of that. So for me, I, I, I'm totally backed away from trying to ask for a direct earmark beginning in the most immediate fiscal year possible. I'm not asking for that. I, I've, I've been persuaded that that's not um, something even uh, uh, remotely possible or wise. So I'm, I'm done with that. But I'd like to say that we would come back to the conversation in fiscal year 26, okay? And, and, and begin now to say, sort of put that on the horizon, if you will. So I'm, I'm clearly for that part of the process. Now, this, the question of, of the, the 2 million and, and haggling over that, I don't even know why that's necessary per se. If we're committing ourselves to this process of earmarking based, not earmarking, but process of um, continuing to strive to make an annual contribution based upon the initial step taken last year of 200,000, that we're committed to that for the coming fiscal year, if anything is certified from certified free cash is available, as close to 200 as possible, put it away. The next year, put it away. On to 26, then let's see where we are from there. That to me, I've been persuaded, makes the most uh, uh, sense fiscally, doesn't tie the hands of the council as it looks to go into financial hard times. And so I'm, I'm just there, but I don't really know about the, the, at this point with that idea in mind as the approach that you know, two million and haggling over, you know, to a million and, and how finite this thing is, it's, this is just blowing my mind that in order to get this, this little approach we're trying to take done, we've got we've to go ahead and, and, and nail down the ceiling of what's possible here. I, I'm really having a hard time with that. Yeah, and I really appreciate that, um, Dr. Shabazz. And um, I, I will say that I don't think this is necessarily a ceiling in the sense that um, I feel very strongly that the $2 million commitment is, that's the number that we've discussed. It's meaningful, it's significant. I ran some numbers um, and, and again, we looked at Evanston and what their budget is four times ours. Um, and I understand that we are not Evanston, but it's sort of in line. Um, and I know they did a lot of work to understand to, to come to that 10 million. Um, and I crunched some numbers looking at this as an endowment, as we've talked about. And um, I really believe that getting it up to that $2 million mark is really important. And so um, I will definitely be pushing for that personally um, as a counselor in, in committee. Um, but I don't believe that it's a ceiling. And I say that because as the program gets underway, as we begin to um, direct benefits, um, and as um, other initiatives of the town become stabilized, there's absolutely an opportunity at any point in any council, in any review of the budget guidelines annually for us to, or for the ceiling to raise higher. And so I, I know that maybe doesn't make you feel a whole lot better, but I do see that there's possibility for increasing that number down the line. I think what's most difficult right now is the concerns about the financial picture ahead and the challenges and, and sort of the unknowns with all of the things you mentioned, like inflation and um, all of the other challenges that we've talked about quite a bit now. Um, Dr. Rhodes. I just want to make sure we're clear on, at least myself, want to be clear on this. When we say modeling uh, after cannabis, uh, what I understand that to mean is that 
uh, the uh, money that will go in, uh, go to the AHRA uh, fund uh, uh, in terms of going into the stabilization fund is that uh, if, for example, uh, fiscal 23 uh, certified cash, uh, we will say that that number that goes into the um, AHR fund and the stabilization fund will be uh, the amount, the similar to the amount of money that was came through uh, the can cannabis, for instance. If it was 200,000, then the free cash, the free cash was there for 200,000, then 200,000 would go in there for fiscal 23, whatever it was in fiscal 24 would go there and fiscal 25, et cetera. Is that what we're talking about? That's my understanding, yeah, um, of what the modeling looks like. So we would be looking at, like, for example, last year in FY22, um, they looked at FY21 actual numbers of cannabis tax revenue um, to make that appropriation from certified free cash. So, uh, you know, there's risks and, and benefits um, we aren't sure what the trending is going to look like in terms of um, the cannabis tax revenue, given what we've talked about in uh, there being competition um, in the communities surrounding us, being that we've lost one recreational facility. However, we, I believe, have the capacity in Amherst to go up to eight recreational. Um, and so, I think that's another reason why the $2 million, for example, um, why the $2 million is important or having that is because um, it may be that one year only 150000 comes in for cannabis tax revenue. And then in two years from now, it might be up to three hundred, you know, or depending on how things go. So there is, I think last week I shared with you what Sean had projected um, for the next several years, which is basically 200,000 a year. And I think he's projecting that conservatively, um, but not too conservatively given that the numbers that they um, were throwing around from this year, um, which were definitely lower. Does that answer your question, Dr. Yeah, and, 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 and I think that that's, um, I, I like that model because it, it does say exactly what's going to go into uh, the um, stabilization fund and what and, 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 and the, uh, the, the number will be determined by what cannabis brought in. Uh, so and so I, I, I go along with that. I also want us to really understand, that uh, that is really a better alternative than to go with an earmark. And the reason for that is that uh, everyone is saying that literally that the HRA will stand, uh, stand behind the firefighters, um, the, uh, the uh, other areas um, such as uh, DEI, uh, and, 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 and those three things are big. Uh, those are big numbers as it moves through. Uh, when, when I hear that you got the firefighters uh, funded by AARP money, uh, we know that for fiscal 23 and 24, uh, 24 is that money disappears to AARP. It has to be spent by the end of fiscal uh, 24. ARPA. Yeah, the money has to, has to be spent by the end of fiscal 24, that's federal law. So you can imagine what that means. If you get firefighters, uh, the DEI and CREST uh, fundamentally being funded by temporary funds and those funds disappear, uh, and yet they are still a part of the budget. That's a huge number. That number will come back to haunt this town physically for years to come. So 
I want us to have our eyes open that um, this, this, if the council votes to approve it, at least guarantees us that we will have money going into that fund regardless of the physical, physical uh, situation that the town will be facing in the future because they're committing to putting that money in there based upon what has been raised with the cannabis, but not coming from cannabis money. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. And, and I think, you know, part of this is also really having a bit of um, trust, um, developing trust between all of us that I think we're all trying to put our best foot forward here. Um, and we're all trying to build this fund. Um, and, you know, like anything, the financial picture will need to be considered um, annually. But I think what you said, Dr. Rhodes, about, you know, making this meaningful and being assured that this fund will be developed over time um, through that that method. So um, it's 237. And I do think there are uh, one or two people or three people in the participants. So I'm going to pause for a second to Dr. Shabazz, is your hand raised? No. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and pause and call for public comment. And then uh, we'll have a little more time for discussion after that. So I'll just read the public comment statement. <clears throat> During the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public. When called upon, please identify yourself by stating your name, pronouns, and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair based upon the number of people who wish to speak. Uh, we won't respond um, except in unique circumstances. Sometimes I have seen that done, but generally speaking, we will not respond, but we'll be listening closely. Um, and so if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand by using the raise hand function. And I see Lauren, so I'm gonna move you in Lauren. Just give me one second here. All right, Lauren, we, you're here. <laughs> Hi, hope you can hear Hi. me. Hi. Yes. Hi. Okay. Um, yes, I live uh, at um, Long Meadow Drive, Long Meadow Drive, South Amherst. And um, I first wanted to say it was a beautiful weekend and I really appreciate all the, the work that went into the, um, the Juneteenth tour and the celebration on the common. Um, and my, I just got a new phone and I had to um, trade it with my daughter in order to, to speak and use the computer. So I had a lot of notes, but as usual, someone, you know, has to use my phone. But anyway, um, I had a few um, notes and one of the, the uh, issues that I have is that with the term BIPOC, I don't think it's realized that, you know, Black people in Amherst or around the country can be Black, they can be Indigenous, and they can be people of color at the same time. And I think that throughout this conversation of reparations, it seems that there, there's always this um, issue of bringing up other communities that may need reparations or, you know, are in need of restorative just, justice, which is true. But in, in the work of, of this assembly and also the, the the, the things that have occurred, especially in 2020, have happened to a particular community and obviously affect all of us, but they continue to happen to pretty much Black people. And so I, I really think that 
it's important for the assembly and also going forward with the conversation of reparations to really, you know, focus on that and not lose the focus. And I, so I, I just want to say that. And also, I just also feel like um, there hasn't been enough outreach to communities of color or BIPOC or Black heritage, however you want to put it, to really put a, you know, certain numbers in, you know, this policy. And I would rather see a, a vote postponed if it want if you guys want to come come down to a vote. I just don't think that it's really fair to put certain, you know, dollar amounts or even like how the money would be used without really consulting a body of BIPOC or African heritage community members. So I'll just leave that at that. I always have more to say, but I'll leave it there. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you very much. And I just took notes <laughs> while you were speaking. So thank you. Um, is if there's anyone else that would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. Just wait a second. Okay, so not seeing any. So just coming back here for the last few minutes that we have um, to see if there are any additional comments, questions, thoughts. Yes, Dr. Rhodes, please. All right, so the reality here is that there is there is a threat, uh, you know, uh, in terms of this model. And if that is, uh, is how money gets into the stabilization fund. Uh, Given what I'm seeing out there coming up, the risk that I see is that um, uh, the capital projects that are forthcoming uh, are going to um, put an incredible strain uh, on 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 the on the the uh, capital uh, account, and therefore there's going to be a lot of pressure to increase the amount of money. Uh, that would go into capital, although that you know has has a ceiling to it. But there will be times when the council and the finance director, town manager are going to say, "Look, we have to um, put more money into capital. And if we're going to put more money into capital, uh, the the way to do that is to use money that would be going into the stabilization fund and direct it to uh, the reserve fund." Uh, that is a risk. And so all of us should understand that. And as far as I'm concerned, and you know, when I look out over the capital projects uh, that are there, I, 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 I see that the library, the school, the DPW, et cetera, are those, those estimates for spending are going to be 20 to 50% higher when we actually go out to bed and there's gonna be enormous pressure. So we all need to understand that, that that's going to be there. Thank you, Irv. Um, remember, um, I think at the time of our meeting with the finance committee, when these matters are being discussed, um, I know that Andy will give We'll open the floor. Um, and I think the way he does it is there's not really an order. Raise your hand. Uh, that's the order. So whether you're from the HRA or from the Finance Committee. Um, Dr. Shabazz. Thank you. So I, I, my final comment uh, is, is along um, similar lines to what we heard in public comment. Um, the, uh, the third event that um, the uh, person commenting, uh, Ms. Mills actually attended, uh, uh, that was held on Monday, that was held in her community, um, really brought out what she's saying in terms of people who are, you know, part of other ethnic groups or other kinds of identities, but also share with, with Black folk, 
Uh, we had Dominicans there joining in the drum circle. We had, uh, you know, they're, they're people from, from other different uh, nationalities or, or ethnicities that may not always be identified as, uh, or, or not categorically Black, but, uh, but, but do have Black ancestry and do have a connection with, uh, with us here. So um, I, I, I concur that, you know, there is um, complexity. And um, when I, as I share my thoughts on the, what we've been calling this eligibility question, you're going to see that what, I'm what I will recommend is that we take a spectrum approach not a binary. We got to get out of the binary of American descendants of slavery on the one hand and those who are not American descendants of slavery. And if you're not an American descendant of slavery, you're out, you're out of consideration for, for, for uh, the discussion of reparations versus, you know, those who, who um, would, would uh, uh, be categorized as Black or African-American, but they're not American descendants of slavery. What Sandy Darity estimates uh, as only about 10% of the total Af Black African-American population anyway, less than 10% are, are in that group. But, but for me, we, we get away from that when we, when we approach from a spectrum. And by that, I mean that we look at the harms across the spectrum and we look at the um, uh, 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 the way in which we can redress uh, that and, and bring closure to those harms across the spectrum. So prioritizing for certain aspects of the reparative justice program, things that are specifically targeted to American descendants of, of, of the enslaved, specifically in Amherst as residents of Amherst, and then being able to look beyond that to other ways in which there are benefits, community benefits, as you put it in this bullet item, that would also extend to other Black African Americans who may not be have the lineage criteria, meet the lineage criteria of a descendant, of being the descendant of an ancestor who was enslaved in the United States of America or in Massachusetts or in Amherst but rather embrace all of that, the whole spectrum. So ancestral bridges, folks we were with on Saturday, some of them actually do fit that criterion of being residents of Amherst who had an ancestor that, that goes back to the time in which slavery was still practiced in Amherst, was still allowed and legal and practiced in Amherst. The Thompsons, the, the, the uh, uh, you know, and, and, and others. So, uh, that fought in the Civil War and all of that. So, you know, there are some that meet that criteria, but we're not limited to just that. There are some that are American descend that are descendants of the enslaved like myself, but not in Massachusetts or not in Amherst, but I live here now. Yes, I would be in the, in, you know, be in the program uh, for consideration. And then even those who come here since 1960, that are black or African American that did ex that have experienced harms of anti-black racism in Amherst would also be if we take us an approach of looking at it on this on a spectrum would also be eligible for consideration and for some discussion about activities benefits that would also address that part of the spectrum. So that's. I'll be coming with with with, with uh, my rationales for that and, and more on that, but uh, but I just wanted to highlight it now, consistent with what we heard from the person in public comment, that it 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 doesn't have to be all one thing or we don't have to be binary about this. We can we can take a spectrum approach and, and as we consider the benefits, the eligibility criterion, and the kinds of restitution and redress that we that we aim to we, we try to bring about. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Shabazz. Yeah, I appreciate you um, foreshadowing that and um, also just addressing Lauren's um, comments about I, I 
I think that we determined in our last meeting that once we get through this piece of financing and finding the revenue stream, we're going to turn fully toward engaging with residents of African heritage in the community um, and making that our <clears throat> our next very full mission. Um, so I also wanted to just say that um, when speaking with Alderwoman Robin Ruth Simmons early on, I asked her why she had in her resolution and um, I believe in the initial resolution and maybe even in the one that committed the funds used the term African-Americans and not black. And what was the rationale, you know, and um, she had said that if she could have a do over, she would have used the word black um, as opposed to African American. Um, and so I just put that out there as, as some experience, anecdote, anecdotal experience. Um, okay, so are there any other comments or questions in closing before we will close out this meeting and then we will, you'll enter in, um, I believe, just on the um, link for the finance committee meeting, you didn't receive a particular panel invite for that, right? Last time we just entered, you entered in. Okay, um, so that means. What's how that, we, Dr. Rhodes? Yeah, how do we enter into this meeting, this finance committee? Yeah, um, when we get off here, I'll send you the agenda and it has the link right in the top. You just click on that and then Athena will see you. And when it's time for that conversation to happen, she'll bring you in as a panelist. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and I just check, checking the agenda real quick, making sure I didn't miss anything. So I did not have any, um, anything that I did not anticipate. Um, if there aren't any other member reports or comments, then I'm going to move to adjourn the meeting and we'll see you soon. Is everybody able to be there at the finance committee meeting? Yes. Okay. Thank Yvonne, you. you're not able to be there. Okay. Um, no, Hala, will you be there at three o'clock? Okay. Thank I you. will, I'm just doing, I'm working and doing double duty so I could, uh, but I will. Okay, no worries. Okay, we'll see you all and Yvonne, we'll give you an update after the meeting, okay? <laughs> You're muted, Yvonne. Can you send me the link in case I can, I could probably do like the first 10 or 15 minutes and then I have to bounce. Absolutely. So can I'm you send, send me the link? Everybody. Yeah, sure, that's great. I'll send it to everyone now. Okay, so I'm adjourning at 2.54 p.m. and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.